for that warm introduction. Andy, thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm excited to be back. This is a, a very, very familiar context for me, uh, not because I spend a lot of time over here with this organization, but so much of this feels uh, like a locker room scenario. Uh, so much of this feels like what we're getting ready to do at Kansas. We've got all of our new players and former players, football and basketball, returning back for the summer session. So we'll have a meeting very much like this. Uh, with camaraderie building, with marching orders, with accountability, all those types of things because that's what high functioning championship teams do. And I love to see even the ecosystem around here as I'm seeing championship type banner, uh, uh, visual aids around here. And so uh, I really like uh, what that's uh, creating. And uh, I'm, I'm hopeful to see you guys be able to go on uh, to accomplish more of those and to, uh, to celebrate some more. Look, I'm happy to clap along with Andy. I'm happy to clap along with some of the numbers that were thrown up here, but the Kobe Bryant video, I'm not clapping for that, all right? Andy asked me to share a couple of my favorite Kobe stories, and the reason why I'm not clapping for him, as much as I respect his legacy uh, and his talent, he busted my ass for the small amount of time that I was in, uh, in the NBA. And the, the, the one that, that comes to mind was actually my first Kobe encounter. This was my rookie season. Uh, I was playing with the Heat. This is a Christmas Day game. We're playing in Los Angeles on Christmas Day. Uh, whole country's watching. You know, the Shaq-Kobe breakup had just happened, and so there was a lot of, like, hype and hoopla behind that. The guy that I was playing behind, and I was totally a role player uh, in the league, you know, played very, very minimal minutes, uh, got in early foul trouble, and so I was in the game uh, late in the first, uh, late in the second quarter. And so I was guarding Lamar Odom. I don't know if you guys know who Lamar Odom is, uh, 6'10", Viper. If Kobe's a Mamba, like Lamar Odom, big, big problem. And I got switched off on Kobe late shot clock, okay? I don't know if I got any basketball guys, so you guys kind of picking up the scenario. So late shot clock, me and Kobe, I'm on an island, okay? So I'm down in the stance. I'm looking over his shoulder, looking at the shot clock, man, thinking, I hope this thing is over quick. Right. He's looking over my shoulder thinking like, oh, this is light work right here. Like he, he's not even considering me in front of him. He's looking past me to see who's like passing me because he knows I'm barbecue chicken. And so so I'm down in the stance. I'm looking at the shot clock. I'm hoping it's over quick. I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about Christmas Day, y'all. Like I'm thinking about everyone on Christmas Day. And I still remember it. he goes scissor behind the back. Hezzy, and then he raises right up in my face, okay? And so I, I didn't even get a chance to, like, contest a shot. I sit down, I'm like, I freeze just like this, all right, which is a bad look in basketball. He raises up, strokes to three, and then in kind of typical Kobe fashion, like, you know, like different top players have their mannerisms, you know, LeBron, like, blows the hands and things like that. He kind of backpedals like this, like, man, that was way too easy. To make it worse, that play happened in front of our bench, OK, in front of our bench. So the place here, the bench is right here. And as he's backpedaling, he looks over my shoulder and D-Wade and Shaq are on the bench, which it was a problem, which is why I was in the game getting my ass busted. So he looked over my shoulder and looked at Kobe and Shaq and was like, who, who the fuck is it? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? You better send somebody else. And, you know, needless to say, that doesn't help my confidence. But it's Kobe. Right. So I know it's Kobe. And so I'm running back on offense, and I turn and look over my shoulder, and I see all my teammates covering their mouth laughing. <laughs> now, that's what really made me mad, right? Like, oh, it's one thing for Kobe to, to hit a J in your face and talk stuff, but it's another thing to have all your teammates, like, laughing at you. Sadly, I was not in the place on the team where I could call for the ball back and, like, go at him. And so the next defensive possession, he got to the paint. I gave him a hard foul, and guess what? <laughs> foul took me out of the game, and then as I'm walking to the bench, he says, yes, yeah, sit your ass down. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a Kobe fan in that regard uh, because I still have PTSD from that experience. But obviously, I appreciate his legacy, his talent, and it's interesting about that video. Um, a, a couple things I'll say about that, um, a, a, about the video, is uh, that was the video where he was up, you know, the Lakers were up 2-0. I forget who they were playing. He said, hey, the job's not done yet. It's interesting in our championship experience uh, with the Heat in uh, 05, 06, and I'm still a big Heat fan. I'm cheering for the Heat. I can tell you guys a little bit about that, is that we were down 2-0 against Dallas. 
in the finals. All right, we actually lost home court advantage. Dirk Nowitzki was playing on that team. He was the MVP that year. We found ourselves down 2-0, and we found out that Dallas had actually planned the parade, uh, the championship parade, because no team had come down from 2-0 in that time. And the reason why and we came back, won four straight, and uh, beat them for the championship. And the reason why I bring that up in light, in light of the video is just thinking about, like, how are you guys finishing? Like, like do you finish strong? Um, you know, do you complete the job? You know, like one of the themes that we have kind of on our basketball setting, particularly on Fridays, is finish strong Fridays. You know, like a lot of Fridays, people are like thinking and working towards the weekend and, you know, they can kind of jog through the finish. But, man, are you going to be the type of individual? Are you going to be the type of team player? Are you going to be the type of, of team and unit that's going to finish strong, okay, no matter what the expectation of the scenario is? All right. Obviously, we saw Kobe was able to do that. And closing out that championship, we saw that Dallas didn't do that as we were engaging them, and they ended up losing an incredible opportunity to go down in NBA history as being a world champion. So I don't want to see you guys lose opportunities, uh, the opportunities you have in this place, the opportunities you have outside of this place, by not finishing strong. Another thing that's reminded, uh, that I'm reminded of in that video is, is, is after that game on Christmas Day, we're on the bus, we won, uh, we're on the bus, and then we're asking Shaq to tell us Kobe stories. You know, his favorite Kobe stories because they had the TIFFs and they won three championships together. Uh, and just out of respect for Kobe, uh, one of the things that Shaq did, he just talked about his voracious work ethic and his appetite to be coached, his appetite to be challenged, his appetite to be driven to greater lengths of, you know, expanding his craft. And it's really interesting that you guys have an opportunity here, as I saw, if it was a, a, called Leadership Academy. What was it like? Leadership yeah, leadership class. Like, if you guys have any type of aspiration to be great or lead at anything, I, I'm here to tell you that the bare minimum gives you zero chance of attaining that. Okay? Like, this is the bare minimum, right? Showing up, free breakfast, showing up to work on time, showing up, doing what's required of you, right? But who in here is going to go above and beyond? Right. Who in here is going to want to be coached, is going to want to be challenged, is going to see volunteer opportunities like that and to know that that's actually not optional. Like you're going after that with a desire to grow and to learn and to go to the next level. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But you're not allowed to have expectations of greatness. You're not allowed to have an expectation of more opportunity coming your way. If you can't be faithful in the small things like you guys discuss here. All right. You shouldn't be expected to be entrusted, entrusted with more. All right. Um, and so um, uh, I brought a little visual aid here with me. And this is what I really want to talk to you about. Uh, it's interesting. I, I talked about a pilot last time that I was here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of some some uh, Air Force aircraft stuff here. I actually used to want to be an a, a Air Force pilot, but I grew too, too much and I can't fit in an airplane cockpit. So I just have to. Uh, kind of live vicariously through others. And so one of my uh, unique roles, man, I get a chance to be around a lot of incredible leaders. And so at KU, during the football season, uh, we have a lot of flyovers. And so one of my uh, roles is I get a chance to host the squadrons that do the flyovers for, for our games. And uh, it just so happens, this was two years ago, right before our championship season uh, with men's basketball, one of my favorite planes did a flyover uh, over uh, Memorial Stadium, and it, it's the, the A-10 Warthog. Anyone, anyone ever heard of the A-10 Thunderbolt, A-10 Warthog, all right, uh, for the military guys out there? Well, the unique thing about that is, is it has this really cool weapon system on the front of it, and it's a Gatling gun, okay? I fell in love with a Gatling gun because my favorite movie back from the 80s was this movie called Predator, okay? For some of you young pups, just watch it, all right? OG, we're not talking green screen explosions, we're talking Arnold, Carl Weathers, muscles, guns, aliens, all that. Just do yourself a favor, check it out this weekend, okay? Uh, one of the dudes on that had a Gatling gun. Ever since I saw that, I was like, man, it's, it's my favorite. Anything associated with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love it. So this A-10 Warthog, all right, has one of the most advanced weapon systems on it, a Gatling gun mounted at the front of the plane, and it shoots 65 rounds of these per second, all right? Per second, 65 rounds of these things, all right? That's pretty hellacious, right? I mean, that's unbelievable. And then not to mention, it's got this other incredible arsenal 
of laser guided bombs and all different types of stuff. So I'm sitting here with these pilots. I'm showing them out on the field house. I'm taking them to practice. I'm like a little kid in a candy shop and I'm just asking them questions. And I ask them this, tell me about the Gatling gun. Tell me some stories of when you've had to use that thing, all right? Tell me some stories of the laser-guided bombs when you use those type of things. And these are guys that have seasoned multiple deployments, Iraq, Afghanistan. So these dudes have been in the storm when it comes to, to firefights. And it's interesting. I was surprised and disappointed that they didn't use that thing nearly as much as what I thought they would. And it's interesting because I was like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you have one of the most advanced weapon systems in the world and you hardly use it? Like, that does not make sense. What's your job? What's your role on a daily basis? And much to my surprise, they said this. They said, hey, the A-10 Warthog or the A-10 Thunderbolt, like, sure, it's, it's kind of known for having the Gatling gun, but it's real use. It's day-to-day -day utility is to fly as low and slow to the ground to draw enemy fire away from the troops on the ground, okay? All right, you got to fly as low as it can, to fly as slow as it can, and to draw enemy fire away from the troops on the ground. That was its role and responsibility. So in my mind, I'm like, gosh, that's not real sexy. That's not real cool. That's not the biggest opportunity out there. Man, where are the, the body kills and the and the gunshots and this and that. And it was really interesting to me because multiple times throughout the history of the military, the A-10 Warthog has been on the chopping blocks for decommissioning. Decommissioning means, hey, this is kind of old and outdated. We don't need that thing anymore. But it, you know, with the onset of new technology, new weapons, drones, and things like that, but it's interesting. What keeps the A-10 Warthog in commission? What keeps it in action? What keeps the general command to always step up and say, hey, we need that thing. We can't decommission it. Our troops on the ground want that. And it's because of the role that it plays. It flies as low and as slow to the ground, drawing the enemy fire away from the troops that are fighting on the ground. And so why do I say that? I felt this before and maybe you guys have too. You're longing for an opportunity to show what you can do. You're longing for an opportunity to be able to use a talent or a gifting that you want everyone to see and to be recognized for. You want your reputation to be elevated, okay? You want to be the hero. You want to come in and save the day, and that, that's, that's noble, that's natural. But I'm here to tell you, one of the most needed things for all leaders out there, whether it's in family, whether it's in the work environment, isn't for the next guy to be flashy, to be seen, to be recognized, to have his gifting put on display, but it's for a guy that's going to lay his life down, a guy that's going to take the lesser role, a guy that's going to do the things that nobody else wants to do for the sake of the greater team. That's a great example that we see here from those A-10 pilots, their role and their responsibility. For the championship teams that I've been around, every championship team, every championship organization has had more guys on their roster that need to do that than they have superstars. And this is something that's also very important as you guys think about your careers. That keeps you employable more than anything else. Whether it's here or the next job. That helps your family thrive. That helps your leadership grow that mentality and that, hey, my daily responsibility, man, it might be to do the things behind the scenes, the things that no one else wants to do so that other people can be safe, so that other people can get the credit, so that the team can accomplish the mission. And so hopefully you guys keep that in mind. You guys are, in a sense, deployed here today and this weekend that that's not only what this company needs from you, but it's also what can help you grow and thrive as individuals as well. And I've seen that play out in every area of my life. I've seen it play out in the championship teams that I've been around, and I wanna see that play out in your guys' lives as well. All right, so remember that as you guys are thinking about those things that you don't wanna do, or you guys are thinking about the things that are required of you that you're not gonna get credit for. 
they are valuable. It adds valuable, a value to your life and it adds value to this company and what they're trying to do. All right, so you guys do that? All right, take that out there to the streets, okay? All right, I'll open it up. You guys got any questions? I can tell more basketball stories, more leadership stories. I'll open up to a little bit of Q&A. <coughs>
Yeah, well, uh, Andrew, uh, uh, Andy had mentioned a little bit about, about my faith, and so that, you know, that's my why. Um, man, I believe that I was, you know, fearfully, I was created. I was created with a purpose. I was created with a, uh, a design to be able to have a relationship with God. I believe I was created with a design to have a relationship with others, to serve him and be a part of a purpose bigger than myself. And so I'll say that's my why. And, uh, and through that why, that's one of the things that would inspire me to be able to do the things that are considered less than, you know, to serve the people that are considered to be lower than. Um, because that was what was modeled and demonstrated for me by Jesus Christ in the way that he lived and the, and the death that he died on the cross. And so, like, that standard has been set for me. Uh, and so that's really my why, to be able to do that uh, in my work, in my family, in my relationships, in my finances. Uh, prior to that, uh, my why was all about me, all right? My why was about how much I could consume, how much uh, I could acquire, my why was about my ego and uh, a couple things. And I found myself having everything the world says should make you happy as a 20-year-old college athlete that was headed to the pros. But my life was broken. Uh, I had a wake of destruction in terms of relationships and decisions in my life. Uh, I was purposeless. I was directionless. And I was longing for something greater to live for than myself. And I found that in the Lord, uh, and it transformed my life completely. Uh, that was 20 years ago, July 12, 2003, when I was on the college campus. It'll be 20 years today, uh, and I continue to, to, to uh, go on that trajectory, and uh, man, I'm not turning back. So that's my why as it's infused in, in everything I do. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, I've actually been kind of on this trust kick uh, because I feel like uh, trust is a currency, okay? Uh, Having people trust you with responsibility, with resources, offering trust to other people, uh, thinking the best for them. And so th th there's two books that I've read, uh, one that I just finished and others that I'm reading. Uh, the one right now is called The Speed of Trust all right, by, uh, by Stephen M. R. Covey. And then the other one is written by a son. It's called Trust and Inspire um, by Stephen Covey. Okay. Uh, it's actually a father son and they got the same name. So the names can be confusing. Uh, and so it's really interesting how trust accelerates so much. Right. It accelerates your ability to work with someone. It accelerates uh, your uh, ability to be able to uh, function as a team. And then when there's lack of trust, it talks about there's actually a they call it a trust tax, meaning it costs you money and it slows you down. And so these are just kind of some different things that I'm learning about that. And, you know, there, there are different times and I'm old enough now, I just turned 40, where, you know, I've been wounded, I've been let down, I've been betrayed, I've got some scars like that. And the last thing I want those things to do is cause me to be guarded, closed off and hard hearted to other people to where I don't trust them and to where I don't open myself and my life up enough to where they trust me. And so that's just kind of what I've been I've been hovering and, and thinking about. And then I just watched a, a video yesterday um, on culture and worldview that actually really, really rocked me. Uh, and you can find it on YouTube. I think uh, Disciple Nations is actually uh, the entity that actually created it. I don't know if you guys are on Twitter. I actually posted it yesterday on Twitter. But it really talks about uh, and drills down on some really key aspects of culture and worldview. And I was like, yeah, hey, man, culture is a big buzzword. People are using it every now and then. Like, man, what's a different perspective on how to view uh, culture and worldview? And so I checked that out, that video yesterday, and it really hit me pretty good. And I've been sharing it with some other leaders uh, that I'm in a relationship with. And we've been talking a lot about it. So ch check out those two things, uh, those resources, and I think, uh, I think you'll like that. Man, let's give it up one more time for Wayne.